Okay, we're good. So, <clears throat> first point to write there uh, is how do, how do we actually draw conclusions? So after we organize, we collect the data and we organize it, we put in a graph or a chart, we know how to do that, hopefully now with, uh, we learned some stuff in chapter four about how to collect our data in a reasonable way. And then just we, in the last lesson, we learned how to put this all on a graph or a chart using Excel. Then we actually want to make conclusions from this. So let's look at this example here. And again, you don't have to draw these graphs. So if you're thinking, if you're looking at this lesson, you're like, there's tons of graphs and I don't know how to draw them. You're not drawing any graphs, okay? I'll just tell you what you need to write down. Uh, but for now, we're going to look at this graph and we're going to try to see what conclusions we can draw. So in this split bar graph, and a split bar graph is basically a graph that visually compares two different quantities. What can you, what do you notice right away? And again, guys, no right or wrong answers. If you're like a news, I was gonna say, you're not a mathematician, if you're just a news reporter, and you just wanna know, how are kids doing in school? And then you divide it by male, female, and then you ask them, how much do you like school? From I hate school to I like school very much. Just looking at these results, what would you just generally say? Yeah, Jessica? Most people like school quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Most people like school quite a bit, yeah, for sure. It seems that way, yeah. Any other conclusions? No right or wrong answers, guys. And we'll see a, a maybe a, a difference or a gap between the two groups. It actually does maybe a little bit. Uh, so we don't know the exact numbers, but you could try to estimate this just by adding up the bar graphs. Uh, we have to estimate a little bit. It does actually seem like, I don't know if I'm crazy. Yeah, actually, I kind of agree with you. It does seem like males were asked maybe a little bit more. So who knows? Maybe maybe the day that they got to the school, there were just more, more boys available, right? And again, that would be part of a sampling bias. And I, I'm really glad, by the way, some of you had really great answers about the sampling bias. Um, I can't remember who said this. A couple of you said something similar to this, where you were asking about like you know sleep, and you were saying, well, there's a bit of a bias because if you go at the end of the day, at the end of the school day, a lot of the students that are involved with sports, different extracurriculars, are busy, so they're not the ones completing your survey. So you're missing a whole type of student from your sample, right? That's the sampling bias. And it's a great job. A lot of you did a great job with that. You kind of thought really carefully about what types of bias you had. Some biases that I didn't even think of. Um, is there anything else that we notice here between the men and the women? Boys and the girls here and their responses? The boys seem to like school less than girls. <clears throat> it seems like they like it a little bit less. Just because if you look at the I hate school, it tends to be mainly boys. And if you look at the I like school very much or I like school quite a bit, it tends to be more girls, right? Proportionally, right? Um, so not number-wise, but proportionally, right? So good follow-up question. So, I mean, that, those conclusions that you guys drew were great. But the mo I think the more important question now is why do you think that, that we have that? So that's, that's really what our job is, and that's what I'm going to try to get you guys to do in this, in this lesson is not just look at this graph and then draw, you know, one or two conclusions that something is more than the other, but why do you think that could be, or do you think that maybe, like, what, what else did we not consider here? And like, which school did they go to, right? Like, we don't even know. It says Ontario use. Where did you go, <laughs> right? There's a lot of information that we don't know, right? So again, if you're doing this graph, it's great, but you really have to have more follow-up. And that's why we're learning how to do reports because, and I'm, I know it seems weird to be writing a math, but in this course, you really have to learn how to do that because it's not just about like putting a graph in Excel. You have to tell me, where did you get this information from? Like, who did you ask, right? And I'm not talking about like names, right? We don't care about names, but like, which school did you go to? How many students per, is per school? What, what was the demographic like? Was it more males, females? Was it equal numbers? That stuff is very important, right? You need to kind of emphasize where you got it from. Anyone curious, um, this is always a, 
question, this is one of those sociological questions, and again, the ones who took sociology, maybe you have talked about this. Why, why do you think that boys tend to like schools, uh, school a little bit less than girls? This tends to be a trend that, that a lot of statisticians see, or sociologists. Yeah? I mean, like, normally, when you think of a teacher, like, <laughs> most teachers, like, proportionately in a school are females. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of the content, like, cover a lot of, like, feminism, stuff like that, mm -hmm. that are more related to females than yeah. males. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that's one of the big things I've heard. Uh, one of the reasons I've heard is, like, uh, it tends to just be about uh, it's One factor could be, and it's, it's not a conclusion, but one factor could be the gender of a lot of the teachers, right? Especially at the elementary level, it tends to be proportionally more, uh, much, many more females than men, than men, right? So obviously that could be a factor in it as well. Absolutely, and I think that maybe that comes comes down to it, like the way that we teach maybe isn't structured for different types of learning. And again, I am not a psychologist or sociologist by in no means, and I'm sure your sociologist. Uh, sociology by a psychology teacher or even your science teachers can talk to you all about this gender uh, you know nature versus nurture why are men different than women we don't know right um, but that could be one of the factors is like I think school maybe is more structured to be more liked by girls I don't know I'm not sure why I don't know if I have the full answer there for you right but this would be a great topic right but this is this is what I really wanted to get to do, get you guys to, uh, to do is not just look at a graph and look at just the numbers, look behind it, right? So what do you need to draw a good conclusion? So this is the only thing I want you to write. This is the main thing to write. Um, so in order to have a, draw a good conclusion, you want to make sure that you have enough data collected, right? So that first part is going back to what we talked about even at the very beginning of the course when we were talking about probability. Do you remember how we talked about you have to do things enough times, you have to have enough trials to draw a conclusion? It's very similar to this. You have to have enough data. That's the first thing. And most importantly, who is part of your sample, right? So if you have a sample, because obviously you're not, you're not always going to be able to have a census where you collect data from everyone, you're going to decide, okay, who's going to be part of this sample, right? Uh, you also want to make sure your data is collected in a fair way. So again, this goes back to the whole lesson on sampling, techniques and bias. And the last thing is that you want to consider all possible factors. So I'm going to put on here, I'm going to talk about all possible factors. Another way of saying this is uh, hidden factors. Is there anything that we didn't consider at all, right? Uh, so going back to that graph about, um, you know, whether you like school or not for boys and girls, we have some idea of who was part of it. We can count technically, and then we can know, okay, this is how many boys and how many girls were collect, uh, how part of the sample. Um, you could, someone could tell you, you know, how they collected the, the information, and then you could try to figure out if there was any bias. But then the most important things, were there any other factors? Like, why do we have this, right? Uh, why, like, more, more importantly, why are, why do boys not like school as much as girls, right? That's really the more important question to ask. Or, um, you know, were there, was there anything else that we were missing from that sample, right? Um, or even from that graph, maybe there was something missing in the graph that would get, told us a bit more information. So like I said, there's not too much in this lesson. <clears throat> uh, I think maybe there's only one other kind of writing point. The rest of it is just kind of more looking at different data. And I'm going to show you a couple clips, guys, and I hope you don't mind. Uh, I don't know if I'll show them all to you. It just depends on the timing. Uh, but yeah, we might have enough time. Uh, so I'm going to show you a couple different clips. Um, honestly, I've never put so many videos in one lesson, but it's just because I found like the videos are really good. And they do explain a lot of the ideas that we we're talking about here in class anyways. So again, this is all kind of tying in, right? Um, and again, the reason 
I'm emphasizing this again, you, you're going to need to build nodes for the project, right? This is exactly what you're doing. Making sure you have enough data collected in a fair way and then considering other factors. And the big part of the project is the very end. You actually have to draw a conclusion. At the end, when you're, fin when you're finally in the project, you have to tell me, what did you actually conclude in the end, right? And I think some of you are having a hard time with the topic because uh, you have all these great ideas, like they're awesome pieces of data. But at the end of the day, I want to make sure that you know what is it that you're trying to prove, right? Like, I hope you're not just trying to give statistics. You're actually hopefully are proving a point. Um, so a causal relation. So next little thing to write here. Uh, don't worry about this, okay? Uh, just write the first top part there. So we often want to show if there is a causal relationship between two variables. So what I mean by that and two variables, it's missing an S. And what that means is uh, a scenario where one, uh, one variable directly affects the other. The key word here is directly affects. Because we're actually going to see a couple of examples where it seems like they affect each other and they might kind of affect each other in some way but it's not directly caused, one isn't directly caused by the other. There might be a third factor or something else that we didn't consider. So the really important thing here is to consider any external um, factors, right? And we sometimes call this like a third or lurking variable that we didn't even consider at all. So this graph, this is the most typical graph when you're looking at correlation versus causation. So I'll explain what cause. So correlation, obviously, and Mr. Edwards is going to talk about this tomorrow. Correlation is when you see that two gra two variables seem to be increasing or decreasing around the same time, right? So for example, um, a big a big one here is looking at like you know the number of students that are back going back to school and the sales at Staples, right? You know what happens at Staples, right? September, August, September, boom, 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 sales go up, right? That's a correlation, right? They happen at the same time. And they op and in this case, they do affect each other. These two seem like they're core, they seem like they're they're obviously correlated because their graphs seem to be going up and down at the same time. But are they directly linked? Is one causing the other, right? So let's look at this one. Ice cream sales seem to be going up during the summer. Same with shark attacks. So even though they both seem to be increasing, decreasing around the same time. Does that mean that one affects the other? No, right? Ice cream is not causing sharks to attack them, right? What is the common thread here? What do we notice? Why is this happening? Yeah? During the summer months, when you would buy ice cream or swim in the ocean, it's sharks. Yeah. Well. Exactly, right? So in the summer, it's hotter, right? And the hot season is causing people to go get ice cream. And the hot season is also causing people to go to the beach, which um, which then leads to more shark attacks. Does that make sense? So it's not like the ice cream is causing shark attacks. It's not like you're like, if you eat ice cream, you will get attacked by a shark. But I guarantee you that most people that have gotten attacked by sharks, they probably were doing something summer-like right before, right? And it doesn't mean that that summer activity caused that. It's just that what are the chances that you're going to go to the beach in the winter, right? And there's going to be a shark around that time. Right. And again, I don't I'm not a shark expert, but you definitely probably need to be near the beach and you're probably going to be more likely to have ice cream in the summertime. Right. This all this happens around the same season. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the ice cream sales affects the shark attacks or the shark attacks affect the ice cream sales. It doesn't have to. They don't directly cause each other. They just simply happen around the same time. Does that make sense? That's what I mean by correlation is not the same as causation. Right. So I'll show you this quick little clip. As explained in another video, we calculate the correlation coefficient for two variables to determine not only if the two variables move in the same direction, but also how strong the relationship is. However, as a famous phrase tells us, correlation does not imply causation. In other words, two variables might indeed move in the same direction and the relationship may be quite strong, but this doesn't mean we can draw a, let's say, cause and effect conclusion with changes with respect to one variable causing changes for the other. In other words, the correlation coefficient can tell us that two variables clearly move in the same direction, but it doesn't tell us why. A pretty popular example is represented by ice cream sales being correlated with homicides in New York. 
yes, statisticians may very well have noticed that when ice cream sales go up, homicides do the same, and when ice cream sales go down, homicides go down. But that doesn't mean ice cream makes people kill one another. In quite a few cases, we're simply talking about coincidences even if the correlation coefficient is robust. Or, of course, there can be hidden factors at play. In our situation, we can take a step back and notice that the weather is the hidden factor which affects both ice cream sales and homicides. Simply put, more people buy ice cream when it's sunny outside on the one hand, and more people go out when it's sunny on the other and end up representing potential homicide victims. To put it differently, ice cream sales and homicides may be correlated, but there is no causal relationship there. Whereas there is a causal relationship between the weather and ice cream sales, as well as between the weather and homicides. Pretty logical, right? So yeah, the main the main point here, and again, don't worry about writing it down. If this is we already talked about this, just this is the main idea. Just because two variables seem to affect each other, just even looking at a graph, it doesn't mean that they actually cause each other directly, right? Um, and even if they do, maybe cause each other directly, and this is the other issue we might have, is that we don't even know which direction it goes in, right? So in that last example about the sharks, uh, shark attacks and the ice cream. Maybe it goes the other way around, right? Maybe shark attacks affect ice cream. Like we don't know which one is the independent variable and the dependent variable, right? So this is the hard thing is even on the graph, you might see a correlation, but you don't know which one is the independent variable or dependent variable, right? A lot of times you can take your best shot, but again, you need to analyze the data, right? It's not as easy as just looking at a graph. You have to look that deeper into it. So some examples of correlation not implying causation so let's, I'll give you a couple here. So children with bigger feet spell better. Therefore, having bigger feet causes the child to spell better. First of all, is that true? Yeah. So now you're saying it's not true. So that actually is a fact. I mean, right? But why is it a fact? But the way that it's worded sounds really odd, right? Yeah. Because like, if they have bigger feet, they're likely older. Yeah, exactly. They're, they have bigger feet because they're older, right? But do you see how this can be misleading? Because someone could look at it and be like, oh, that's true. It is true, right? Like if you have bigger feet, like I guarantee you, you do an IQ test. And then you would, and, and again, if you don't tell, if I don't tell you who is a child, who is an adult, probably correct, right? You would, you would look at it and say, wow, like, so if you have bigger feet, then you're going to spell better. But you only spell better because you're older. Is that what you may have said, right? That's the whole idea there. Don't worry about writing the examples down, guys. You you can if you want, and then just like, but if you're and if you are gonna write the examples, don't write as much as I do. I just do this for the cohort that's at home, because so that they know like what what I would what I was saying to you. Uh, but essentially, it goes back down to what Amelia said. It's because they're older, right? So these children, obviously, as they get older, have bigger feet, and they probably have been in school longer, and they're just better spellers for the most part, right? Here's another one. Swimming pool accidents seem to rise as ice cream sales rise. This is actually really similar to the other one we talked about. Does that mean that ice cream sales are causing these swimming pool accidents or people having accidents because of ice cream? No, right? What's what's happening here? Sorry? The weather. The weather, exactly. It's the weather. It's summer, right? It's summer, which means people are out and about. And, uh, and then they go swimming and then they also eat ice cream because it's hot. And then those two things happen at the same time. But it doesn't mean that one affects the other. Does that make sense? So obviously these seem pretty obvious, but there's actually other uh, other studies in real life where people just look at it and they say, like, right away, they say, wow, there, there must be a reason for this. And now we know the reason. The reason this is happening is because of this other variable. But you only look at one piece of data. We don't know exactly if they're causing each other or not, or is it just another variable, or is it just a coincidence? Sometimes it's just a coincidence that things just happen to line up. It doesn't mean that one affects the other. So obviously these are more obvious, but there are cases where it's not that easy to look at. So looking back at that EQAO math exam, it seems like the marks went down. And let's say the marks went down even more. Would that mean that the test was hard or the students weren't as prepared. What what are the what are the possible factors there, right? We don't know the whole story, right? So you always have to look deeper than just the graph. So here's another uh, little video, guys, just talking about lurking variables. I'll talk about what that is. Um, although actually, we'll see in the video what it is. Pause this for a bit. 
So what does that mean? Does that mean that students who, who smoke, does that mean that smoking causes the bad grades? What do you think? Or is there something else there? You guys want to hear from different people? No, there's no right or wrong answer, you guys. Like, there's nothing to be worried about. So just say what you're thinking, I hope. Oh, okay. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. So there are studies. So now Opus brings another element here. She's saying that there's studies that say that it affects your, like, the brain development. So maybe could be linked to that. It could. Anyone else think of that? What, so do you think that this is true? That smoking caused the bad grades? So in Hope's case, we're kind of saying like smoking causes, maybe it delays the brain development, which could then cause bad grades, right? And again, I'm not I'm not a scientist, so not, don't quote me on any of this, um, but I'm just going based off of what the math says, right? Like that kind of makes sense that that would happen. Um, what do you think? Yeah. Well, you're not allowed to like smoke. So. Yeah. So if you're, exactly, so that's a big factor. So if you're a smoker, that's a great point. I didn't even think about that. You probably have to go outside because you have to smoke, which means you're probably more likely to skip classes. I, that's a perfect point, yeah. Hello? Stress. Stress, yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's actually one of the big ones, right? So I think you're kind of getting close to it. So that's what I was actually thinking is that if you're stressed out, maybe because maybe because of grades, that could cause you to smoke. So could it be the other way around, right? So a lot of times when they actually saw that study, a lot of people actually said that. They were like, actually, it might be the reverse. It actually might be the other way around, that the bad grades are causing the stress, and then that's why you start smoking, not the other way around, right? Like, But we don't know, right? The, the thing is, we kind of left it up in the air. We're not even sure of what else, what else is missing. We also didn't consider socioeconomic, which some of you mentioned as well, right? Um, the fact that, you know, we don't know the demographics of the students who smoke, but maybe there's other reasons that they're smoking, right? And they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so here's another one. So it's found the students uh, who, a student is part of competitive sports league, they're more likely to succeed in school. So does that mean that if you join a competitive sports league, that will automatically give you better marks? What are, what are some factors here? What do you think? So a lot of you are saying you had no, but why? Yeah, hope. You have to keep a certain average to stay on the team. So you're automatically, because you're in that sports league, you already automatically have really high marks. So you're not smart because you're on that team. You know what I mean? Like not being on that team doesn't automatically make your brain smart. Although there are arguments that do say that exercise does help you think better, right? So I know some of you are kind of nodding your head, maybe like the other way that you're like, actually, that could be true. It is true that exercise does help you think better, right? So it definitely could go both ways, but mind you, this is saying specifically competitive sports league. So you don't necessarily have to be in a really competitive one. You could just do exercise of some other form. Is there something else? So competitive sports leagues, they probably cost a bit more money, right? A lot of these have to kind of deal with the money, right? Like money aspect of it. If you're playing on a competitive sports league, you probably um, have some sort of support, right? You have financial support, which means your parents probably make a bit more money. If you have more more, uh, more support at home, that also probably goes hand in hand with having more like tutors and getting more help at home. Maybe your parents are able to help you with some of the work, right? Which then can lead to better grades, right? So it's not that simple to just say, you know, if I join a competitive sports league, my marks will automatically jump up, right? We don't know all the other factors. We, we have to consider the demographics of it. And again, there's no right or wrong answer for this, guys. Like, I am just telling you my opinion. I am, and by no means, do not go home and say, tell your parents, like, he said this, and that's true. I'm just giving you kind of ideas of what you should think of, right? When people make conclusions like that, you got to think, well, you sure you considered everything, right? Just being devil's advocate. What about this last one here? Do violent video games make children more violent? I'm sure you guys have heard that a lot. 
you know, the whole argument about video games, especially violent video games, people try to ban them. Actually, a couple countries have banned them because they say that they're really violent and that makes children violent. Is that true? How many of you have played video, violent video games? Yeah. Well, yeah. Like Matt raised his hand, but I'm sure Matt's not violent, right? So does it like so obviously or does that make you more violent? I don't think so. Uh, but anyone think uh, can anyone think of why you why that you might be? What are the variables here? Yeah. Um, with a lot of exposure to like violence, it almost can seem justified. So then, mm -hmm. but in a situation, you're more likely to justify your own actions and. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely think so. Right? Maybe if you're exposed to it more, you become desensitized to it. Um, it could have also. Yeah. Uh, what? Um, it seems like... ah, I got it. Yeah, one of the big things that a lot of people have said is like, you know, it could just be that you know, kids that are already violent even before the video games, they just like it, right? Because if somebody is like more likely to get into fights where like they like that kind of like violent stuff they're obviously going to like the video the violent video games right because that's up their alley so that's not like it's really we don't necessarily know if it's causing it right and again this one's still up for grabs we don't actually know and i've said this is a controversial one i feel like this is one of those things i always argue with people and i don't even know if i have an opinion but i feel like i'll go back and forth because some people will say like it does make you more violent but I don't. I do think that the the video games that you guys have are definitely more violent than the ones I had. Like mine were like you know pretty innocent Donkey Kong and stuff, so it wasn't that crazy. I'm sure you guys have way worse ones, but I don't know if it actually makes you more violent or not. I don't know if I have an answer for that, right? Um, but I think that what Alouette said is kind of true, right? I think the kids who who are maybe more violent or like more violence are more likely to like those video games because of that, right? So I just want to show you another video. And sorry guys, this one's a little bit longer, but I'm not going to show you the whole entire video. I just want to show you some parts of it more. Um, so looking at this one, so we can see here that there does seem to be some sort of relationship between the chocolate consumption, which is on the x-axis right here, and the number of Nobel laureates per 10 million uh, people. And Nobel laureates are the people that win the Nobel Peace Prize. So does that mean that if you eat more chocolates, like if a country eats more chocolates, you know, you're going to get more Nobel Prize winners in your country? Does that even make sense? I'm pretty sure everyone can agree. Like, I'm pretty sure chocolate, because even some of the other ones we did, you could almost argue that they could affect each other. But I think everyone agrees that that eating more chocolate, if a country eats more chocolate, it's not like they're automatically going to get more Nobel prize winners, right? That has no relationship. So what, why is this actually true though? Because it seems quite true, right? They both seem to be going up at the same rate with a couple of outliers. We'll talk about what outliers are. Why does it seem to be going up that way? So if it's not true, why does it seem like it? Anyone want to guess what they have in common? So let's actually look at, it might be more interesting if we just look at the countries that seem to have the higher rates and the lower rates, right? So the lower rates we have, you know, a couple countries here, Brazil, China, Japan, and then at the higher rates we have Norway, Denmark, Switzerland, what do we kind of notice there? Yeah. countries that like produce yeah. chocolate they're probably eating more but exactly they also have like really good education system for countries pretty refined so that we're going green energy like they're kind of ahead of us yeah exactly right we can see a lot of the scandinavian countries norway switzerland sweden like you know they're all they're they all are um have really like you said they're quite advanced especially when it talks about being more progressive, right? So they're more likely to win those Nobel Peace Prize. They invest a lot in education. They invest a lot in the sciences and discoveries. And they also happen to be European countries, which also make a lot of chocolate, right? 
Um, so the fact that like the chocolate isn't helping them, it's just the fact that, you know, if you're a wealthier country, you probably have more access to like making good chocolate, right? Like they, it just goes hand in hand that these wealthier countries in Europe also have to make a lot of chocolate, right? But it doesn't mean that the chocolate is causing it to inflame more prizes. Does that make sense? So that's a really interesting one where the third variable is really just about wealth, the wealth of a country and how much, how many resources they have. Here's another one I thought was interesting, looking at the divorce rate in Maine. So they looked at how many divorces there are per capita. And uh, this is an interesting one. They actually, I think they said something, I think the title was something about like, you know, divorce rates are going down because of margarine or something, right? And it's, it's thinking that margarine causes um, divorce rates to go down because it seems that way, right? So the margarine rates, the, the, the rate that we're buying margarine seems to be going down. And so now that's causing divorce rates to also go down. It seems that way, right? Because they're both going down at the same rate. But does it even, first of all, does it even matter? Like, that doesn't seem like there's any sort of relationship. And what else could, why else would this even be happening in the first place? Could, could it just be a coincidence? Yeah. This one, honestly, I don't know if anyone, it did, it, I actually was looking at this for a while, and I actually really do mean that. Is there another variable to consider? Because I actually couldn't find one myself. That's why I was wondering, maybe you thought of one. Sometimes things are just coincidence. Like this one does not, I'm trying to think of why buy less margarine, why people buying less margarine would cause less divorce. I'm not sure. I have no idea, to be honest with you. I don't, I, I, if someone has some sort of reason, let me know. But sometimes, yeah. One person buying instead of two separate people? Yeah, oh, perfect. Actually, that's a good one. That makes sense, right? Yeah, right? So if you're combined, you're living with someone, then maybe you don't have to buy it as much because you only buy one, right, per household. Yeah, perfect. There you go. I'm actually glad you found, caught that because up to this point, I'm like, I don't think there's any relationship between them. This would be an example of two that just are totally random, just a random coincidence. Here's another one. This one's interesting. Looking at um, the rise in autism uh, and the rise in organic foods, food, uh, organic food sales. They do seem to be going up at the same time. But does that mean that one affects the other? So have you have you guys heard about all those arguments? I, I've seen it, like I've, I've read some articles about that, how obviously autism is going up, like the, the rate at which we diagnose is going up. And a lot of people sometimes blame it on the food that we eat, uh, you know, chemicals, you know, people, you, there's all these theories for it, right? But why do you think that there is more diagnosis for autism? Yeah. Our spectrum has increased. Exactly. Our spectrum increased. A lot of times we worry about it because I, I know like a lot of people will ask like, you know, why are there more, you know, why is there more like diagnosis for autism, ADHD? It's because we have, we, we built up that spectrum, right? Before there was, we didn't really talk about those, um, about the, uh, like this is the spectrum, right? We just basically said, you know, like you can't pay attention. Well, that's your own fault. Now we actually do try to actually find support for people. And so we uh, we allow that diagnosis to happen in the first place, right? And this could just sim simply be happening, happening around the same time that organic food just seems to be going up, right? Because that seems to be the new trend. So both these things are increasing around the same time. We're, we're being more aware of autism and we're also being more aware of the food we eat, right? But I don't think one causes the other. I think they're just both happening around the same time. Here's another really interesting one, looking at the salary and years of education comparing men and women. So it seems like it's pretty even. And then when it's, uh, once they get to the doctorate master's level, it seems like there's a bit more of a gap. So the question here, more, more importantly than anything, uh, what else are we missing from this graph? Because this one just tells us the overall salary. What else should we also know about the men and women behind these graphs. So women do tend to get paid less, right? I think we can all kind of agree. It does, you can actually see it. it's pretty considerable. Um, but why? I can't remember if I showed you guys that video or not where we talked about it. Maybe I didn't show you guys. I think I showed the other class. Why do you think that there could be a gender gap? Is it just that they get paid less just because of gender? Is there other factors for that? That's a heavy one. I know some of you are like, because 
that is not an easy topic. Like talking about the gender gap, there's literally all a whole I'm sh whole courses I'm sure about that. Does anyone want to take a guess? Why do why does the gender gap still exist? Yeah. Sometimes it turns out because they're like it's harder for women to get classes. Salaries. Yes. Yeah. So it's about maybe the jobs that themselves, right? And then the salaries that the entrance salary that we have, right? Um, could it also be? I kind of want to go back to Grace's point. We we're talking about. I think you talked about teaching and how it tends to be predominantly like a lot of females, a lot of professions, a lot of professions actually tend to, like it, they follow a pattern, tend to be male dominated or female dominated. Do you think that that could have a factor as well, right? They could be, right? Um, if you look at nursing, it's predominantly female. Um, certain jobs, a lot of um, certain lower paying jobs, if it's like, you know, we're looking at cleaning, um, it, it tends to be dominated by women, right? Whereas construction is dominated by men, but construction actually pays, it pays really well, right? decently well right so that could also be the gap there as well right when we look at it so there's a lot of different factors that we're looking at we're not we haven't considered what are the types of jobs that they're going into this just gives us the overall salary it doesn't break it down by i think it'd be more interesting in my opinion to actually break it down by profession once you break it down to like a specific job or a specific profession it might be more interesting to look at it um another factor i don't want to get into this whole thing but um could also be about age so I'm, I'm going to show you the video maybe later on one of the big things that they notice is that men and women's salary are actually quite even after university and women actually graduate from university at a higher rate but then it seems like once they get into their maybe late 20s 30s the gap seems to divide why do you think that there seems to be a gap at around that time 20s and 30s yeah uh, like when they start families, then start families, yeah. Like most women will take a pregnant. Yeah, exactly. Most women will take the the bulk of the maternity leave, right? Like men will obviously paternity leave also occurs, but it tends to be predominantly women who do or who are doing like the big bulk of the work, right? Um, and it's obviously changing. I think those demographics are changing, and I think now that work is more flexible and we're allowing more people, I think the gender gap is going to close up a lot more. But you still see, and, and I'm just curious, even in your household, how many of you in your household, it's your mom that does a lot of the work at home, like the scheduling and all that stuff? So you can raise your hand, guys, and I can see. Okay, what about the dads? And, okay, so it's actually kind of split in this class. It's pretty 50-50. Also, we only have 10 people. So, again, talking about sample size, <laughs> you're not getting a good, a good picture here. But I think most of the time, I think you would probably agree that it tends to be, it, it does tend to still be women that do a lot of the work, right? Um, I think that will change. So I think that that is definitely, and it's already starting to change over time. I've noticed that even in my generation, um, a lot more men are taking paternity leave, are getting much more involved than our parents, than my dad ever was, right? I think those things are definitely changing. So I think that's a really good, uh, good positive change that we're seeing, right? Um, so I'm not going to talk about this. It's just a couple more examples. I think we went through a lot of examples already. Um, I just thought they were really interesting. Um, anyone, I just want to talk about that last one. Anyone know why drivers with red cars are charged more for insurance? Yeah. It's a lot more common with red cars to get insurance because it's like this car that you kind of zone out. Yeah, I've heard that argument too. Yeah, that's actually a good, uh, good reason for that. Why else? What do you think of red cars? What do you think? Like what kind of what kind of cars are we talking about? Sports cars, right? It tends to be sports cars, and if you have a sports car, you're probably going to drive a little faster, right? Because no, you're not going to be driving like at training speed if in a nice sports car, right? You're going to be driving a bit faster, which means you're more likely to get into accidents, right? And there's lots of studies that show that driving fast, it's it's instantly uh, leads to a lot more accidents, right? So they're kind of linked hand in hand. All right, guys, so there are the questions there. Uh, so it's page 20, 